I am not a good multitasker at watching the chat while we do this. So I'm, I'm not going to be watching the chat, but I will come back to the chat when um, I'm done sharing about some ideas that I've been thinking about in terms of wise leadership and the future of um, our leadership in terms of our Sangha. And um, I see that, you know, every day, everyone has the capacity to make profound and lasting impacts on the lives of the people that are around us, right? And that that is really the essence of being a wise leader. Um, it's the, the capacity to uplift, to have other people rise with you as a leader, um, to have compassion, to energize, to offer hope, um, inspire others and the capacity to help others feel seen and heard. And there's a, there's sort of this interest. I had a, a client tell me the other day about, uh, her, her company where there's this big push in terms of, um, organizations trying to, and leaderships with leaders within organizations, trying to show people that they care about them. There's even a term now called care washing, sort of like greenwashing, right? Where organizations will put on these wellness workshops. I'll, I'll be invited to speak at some of these wellness workshops. And at the same time, while they're putting on the wellness workshops, they're also sending emails that they're expecting people to respond to, right? Or they have inflexible schedules that um, people can't, keep because their lives are so um, stressed. And there, there's a, there was a Gallup poll in 2024 that looked at um, the percentage of employees who believe that their organization or their leadership cared about their well-being. In 2020, it was 49% of people believe that. By 2024, it dropped to 21%. So we're having this sort of, you know, maybe increase in people telling us that they care about us or that they are there to support us, but then a decrease in, in trust in, um, in leadership. So how can we show up as, as wise leaders and be the, um, the source of energy and care and support for each other if the Sangha is the future of our leadership? And one of the places that I learned, I've learned a lot about this is from Plum Village. Um, last year when we went, when you, when you arrive at Plum Village, you wait, it's, everything is slow. You wait a long time for everything. And, uh, when, when you arrive, you go through all these series of lines of registrations and such, and all these like weary travelers and tired families from all over. And, uh, you eventually get to the line, which is the line where they give you your working meditation. So Plum Village is a working monastery. And when you take a retreat there, you're part of the working monastery. You chop the vegetables, you set up the meditation hall, you um, wash the dishes, sanitize the dishes. And just as I was getting in line, a friend of mine from the year before came up to me and she said, you have to sign up for the toilets, for cleaning the toilets. And um, that was sort of the last on my list that I wanted my family to do was clean the toilets for 300 families. And these are, you know, these are bathrooms that are, uh, people are living in for a whole week. Um, she, she is someone who I would describe as a positive energizer. So positive energizers are actually, um, is, there's actually a term for the type of people who, when you are around them, you feel like a sense of glow and energy and you want to be with them. And you, you kind of will do all sorts of things and say yes to what they ask you to do because it's so fun and energizing to be around them. You feel seen by them. You feel heard by them. You're inspired by them. That's what one of these friends is for me. And there's actually some research by Emma Sapala, who's um, at the Yale School of Management, who's looked at like organizations, that, the areas of organizations, there's like these pockets where there's more productivity and um, there's more loyalty and there's less, um, you know, there, there's, there's a better well-being. And in these pockets, what they found is that there's a higher degree of more positive energizers, right? So positive energizers are a sign of wise leadership. So here I was in line and she's telling me, you should clean the toilets with me. And because she's a positive energizer, uh, I, I said, yes. And um, that experience 
And what it what we did as a family over the course of the week taught me a lot about wise leadership. And I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about some of the practices that came from that experience. It was probably the most impactful, positive part of the retreat for me that that we can use for ourselves. So the first aspect of it is be a positive energizer. Whether you're going into a barbecue, you know, for Fourth of July, July tomorrow, or you work in a work setting, or you have a, a group of people that you meet with, be um, have the qualities of somebody that lifts others up. And the the characteristics of positive energizers is that you see people, you care about people, you ask about people, and you bring some positive energy their way. But the other next thing about wise leadership was what we what we learned and what we started to do on, on the first day of, of toilet cleaning. So here we are, this group of people. And you gotta you gotta think that the group of people that sign up for this are are actually a good group to be in. Like the, these are these are the folks that are willing to get down to it and maybe are there for a reason. And when we started the um, practice, we would always start with a song. And it's a very familiar song. If you've been to Plum Village, you probably know it well, which is happiness is here and now. And so in the song, we sing happiness is here and now. I've dropped all my worries, nowhere to go, nothing to do, no longer in a hurry. Wise leaders slow down. And they don't rush through things because it's in the slowness that actually connections are made. You know, if you were to slow down the beginning of a meeting or slow down enough if you're dropping your kids off at school to get there a little early and talk to other people or slow down enough to do a Zoom call with Rick Hansen, that's where the magic happens because you start to honor that the good is is right here in the relationships that we're building and learning from each other, the conversations that we have when we slow down and that we're not trying to get as much as I believed in the beginning to get to the end of the toilet cleaning. We're, we're in it. And, and there's actually a lot of joy. There's happiness is here and now being in this. So wise leaders guide us to slow. And they do that through the slowness of their actions. Um, if you have seen, uh, you know, videos of Thich Nhat Hanh, um, in any kind of march or activism, he's like slow procession. He's he's uh, protesting slowly, right? And there's there's a power in that. There's a power in that. So wise leaders slow down. Wise leaders also practice wise speech. So there's a. Um, there's sort of four characteristics of wise speech that we can ask ourselves before we speak, which are, is it helpful? Is it truthful? Is it kind? And is it timely? Is it helpful? Is, is speaking right now going to help the situation? And sometimes not speaking is the wisest thing for us to do. Sometimes not adding into a conflict. Um, is it truthful? Are you are you sure? Yeah, there are these big um, banners that were placed along the first year that we went to Plum Village, or placed along the um, the walkway to celebrate the 40th um, anniversary of Plum Village. And one of the big banners when we walked on our walking meditation was, "Are you sure?" So to question yourself: Is this truthful? And before you speak, making sure that it's true to the best of your ability, right? And is it kind? Wise leaders act from a space of kindness. Also, is it timely? Like, is now the time to have this conversation with my partner about this or my kids about that or my parents or this friend group or this community that really the, the context in which we speak can make a big difference in terms of people's capacity to hear us? Um, how is their nervous system doing in terms of their ability to hear us? To be a wise leader, um, we also have to recognize uh, privilege and power and positionality. I have a little saying that I do um, in my house and now at most dinner parties, 
than I'm at and with a lot of clients, um, which is which direction is your E pointing? And I'm going to have you do a little assignment with me, uh, which is to take your finger, your first finger of your dominant hand and draw the letter E on your forehead, like trace it out on your forehead. Oh, this is so good to see you all doing this. <laughs> it's entertainment in itself. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now, if you can remember, which direction did you draw your letter E? Did you draw it so that you could read it or so that I could read it? Was it pointing in or pointing out? So there's actually both. Okay, good. So there's actually some research on this, which um, our context matters in terms of which direction we will um, draw our letter E. In context where we feel like um, we're in a position of power, we're more likely to draw our letter E facing in so that we can read it. When we're aware of other people and perspective taking and, you know, hmm, I wonder how, what I want them to read it, right? We may draw our letter E facing out. This isn't good or bad, but it's good to notice. And, and that in, when you are in a position where you have privilege or power, you often don't know that you're in that position. You don't feel it because you're in a position of privilege or power. And you're also more likely to take your own perspective because you don't see, sorry for my light, um, that there might be other perspectives besides your own. So this is just like a fun little exercise that you can put people through at the dinner table or your family through. And it's kind of funny to see how your, how your family turns out if you have a 4th of July barbecue, how everyone lands on the letter E thing. The practice is to have your letter E face both ways. It's helpful to know and see your own perspective, right? It's helpful to understand what is it that I want? What is it that I need? What works for me? And it's also very helpful to get behind the eyes of another person and take their perspective. How does it feel to be them in this situation? What is it like for them? So at the, um, to back to the toilet cleaning, you didn't know this was going to be the whole hour. <laughs> But so when we were doing our, our service meditation, um, at the beginning of the service meditation, the, the leader, the volunteer, um, asked us to think about what is our volition? What is our motivation in cleaning these toilets? And, and some people said things like, uh, oh, my volition in cleaning is I, I actually have never cleaned a toilet. And I thought this would be a great place to learn some expert, you know, bathroom hygiene etiquette. But then other people said things like, well, when I come to Plum Village, I get so much. And I thought I wanted to take on the task that would be the most challenging for me because it would be the, the way that I could give back the most. Someone else said, um, when I clean the toilets, I think about all the little children that are going to come in here and brush their teeth tonight and have a clean little bathroom. I'm cleaning it for them. And I, you know, I, I didn't know at first what my answer would be, but over the period of the week and cleaning it and contemplating a lot <laughs> in this long service meditation, um, I, I really started to contemplate all the people in the airports, in my kids' schools, who have cleaned my bathroom for me. And um, with deep gratitude to have these spaces that we work together, you know, uh, to make a clean bathroom to come into when you're at the airport. Yeah. So the volition can be, in leadership, can, can be a volition where you recognize our interconnectedness and you recognize the E in and the E, I, the e out. Um, positionality, positionality and power, but also um, how much we impact each other with our actions. 
I believe that another um, quality of wise leadership that we all could practice more of is um, noble silence, speaking less. And uh, I, I interviewed this fascinating um, psychologist who specializes in relationships, and she wrote a book about secure relating. Her name's Anne um, Kelly. And she talked about how when we're in conflict and we're like in, in threat, a lot of us have a tendency to talk a lot. <laughs> we're trying to like get our point across and get the person to get our point and do they understand? And so we speak in, she described as speaking in essays. And when we feel threat or we feel this urgency to get someone to understand and we start speaking in essays, guess what? We lose them somewhere in the essay, right? We've all, we've all been on the receiving side of an essay, right? And we just start to tune out. So Anne recommended, she said, you know, check in with your nervous system. And if it's activated, speak in sentences, not essays. Sentences. I would add to that, that check in with your nervous system, a wise leader checks in with their nervous system and practices noble silence, says less. At Plum Village, we practice noble silence from bedtime, from dinner, after dinner, all the way through morning, uh, through breakfast, through meditation, through breakfast. And so I, I bring these, you know, I bring two teenage boys with me. Actually, one of them is not a teenager, two adolescent boys with me. Uh, they started when they were nine, nine and um, 11, and now 14. And so it's, it's challenging to practice noble silence of, you know, getting your kids together and getting it. And so we, we, uh, we have a little a mini cheat for our family where we keep a little notebook. And if you have a very essential question, you can write it in the notebook and you can pass it to someone and we'll pass it back. And uh, I found, I was digging, I was getting ready to go on this trip and I was digging through my stuff and I found our little notebook. And I'm like, oh, this is so, this is going to be the most essential. Like, I can't wait to read what we wrote to each other during Noble Silence. And I opened it up and it said things like, where's the sunscreen? <laughs> Are you going to bike? <laughs> you know, just, I mean, th those were the things that felt so, so essential, right, to say to each other. And then can you imagine all the other things that we didn't say that we thought were not essential? There's so much that we, that we say that's not essential. Um, but I did find in there a few notes that were like, I love you. I love you too. So having a practice of, of noble silence for, for all of us to be wise leaders helps us in so many ways. It brings us back to the present moment, we become better listeners, we practice in silence with each other, we feel each other better. We notice each other's facial expressions and walks and all the nonverbal communication that we share as species. Um, I've been have had a really wonderful opportunity to interview Stephen Porges a couple of times and I, I interviewed him right at the, he's the founder of polyvagal theory. I interviewed him right at the, like March 15th, 2020, right when we were getting into lockdown. And um, he, he was talking about how concerned he was about us as a species, how we were going to get through this COVID thing because of our threat systems being so active and because of all the nonverbal cues that we're going to be giving to each other through our eyes, through the tone of our voice. Right. And he said at the end of the interview, I'm like, I'm like, so what are you going to do? And he said, I'm going to Costco. <laughs> like, oh, great. Now we're doomed. We're all going to Costco. And then post, post all of that, I interviewed him again. But this time when I interviewed him, the first thing he did was he flipped around his, his screen and he showed me where he was, which was this beautiful ocean in uh, Florida. And he said, my nervous system during COVID got so out of tune that we ended up coming to Florida. And now this is what I look out on to tune my nervous system back up. It's in these moments of silence that we can notice our own nervous system. We can regulate our own nervous system. 
And then we can transmit the nervous system that we want to be transmitting to our, our Sangha. Right? Because we, the Sangha, is, is the wise leadership. So be a positive energizer. Practice wise speech. Notice the direction of your E. Which way is it pointing? <laughs> right? Don't hurry. Practice noble silence. And then here's one that I think we need to pay attention to, which is um, as wise leaders, we need to let the children lead. So I had the opportunity this spring to participate in a um, six campus wide, UC campus wide uh, research study led by Alyssa Apple. And what we did was we were disseminating um, resilience for college students, climate resilience skills for college students across six UC campuses. We didn't know that during the period of teaching these resilience skills, which included things like I'd walk in and I'd put out the altar, I'd bring my bell, put out some flowers. We're like in these like, you know, classrooms with the desks that are attached to the chairs in rows. <laughs> You know, we're trying to get everyone in a circle. We didn't know that um, during these eight weeks together that we would have an encampment um, build right outside our classroom and that we'd be walking through the encampment to come to class. We didn't know that our last class, the encampment would take over our classroom and we wouldn't hold it. But what we did know going in to this was that the students and the children um, are experiencing levels of stress and uncertainty that uh, are incredibly overwhelming to them. And so I, and at the same time, they're incredibly wise. They, they are so, um, so bright and so attuned to what's going on and, 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 you know, massive activists as well. And so we, um, you know, we'd have these like little circles and I, and I'd, you know, I'd ask them like, what, do, what are you feeling about our world right now? Like, how are you feeling about it? And they would say things like apathy and overwhelm and anger and, um, you know, like fear. And, um, and then I would ask them things like, okay, and so what do you do when those feelings show up? And they would say things like, I just try and not think about it. I try and not talk about it. I um, get overwhelmed by it. I get so stressed. My favorite was I go and walk around Target. <laughs> and so we took these kids out and we took them on like a nature retreat, you know, and, and had them sit in the grass and had them look at, you know, look at flowers and eat a tangerine mindfully, right? All the things that are, um, you know, the, the basics of, of mindful awareness and um, and what they, they came back at the end of the class saying was really that the most helpful thing for them in that class was feeling the collective support of the, of, of their peers, of being able to talk to their peers about what they're feeling. And then they developed all these projects as a result of it, these climate projects where, you know, one group made a podcast and one group made a clothes um, repurposing program and, you know, all these creative ideas in which they were going to take the resilient skills that they developed um, to take action towards the things that they were most worried about, that they now had skills on board, but also the capacity, coll collective capacity to take action, which is, which is also very much part of, of our resilience. So let the children lead, give the children the resources to lead, but let them lead. They got way more technology smarts than, they, than we did. Um, and um, and when, when Ty, whenever he led um, a, a walk, he would always lead the walk with children's hands at the front because he would say, this is our future. And whenever we do a Dharma talk, whenever we go to these large Dharma talks and Thai, whenever he would lead the large Dharma talks, the children would always come in at the front. 
at the beginning. And Ty would say, the children are going to be here for 15 minutes because that's all that they need. The adults are going to stay for 45. <laughs> right. So wise leaders see our children as our future and that when we care for our children, um, that we are investing in the wise leadership of our future. So the last, um, the last aspect of wise leadership is, um, I believe, a wise mindset. And one of the, the, widest, the wisest leaders that I've ever met um, is Christiana Figueres. And I don't know if you're familiar with Christiana Figueres, but I first heard about her. Um, I go to Costa Rica. I lead retreats in Costa Rica um, once a year in April. If you ever want to come, come with me to Costa Rica. It's fantastic. But I, um, I first heard about her in Costa Rica. Her father was the president, three-time president of Costa Rica. His, her father was responsible for um, abolishing the Costa Rican, the, the army, the military. Um, and that, you know, when you go to Costa Rica and you're getting like trinkets for your family on the way home, you get the t-shirt that says Costa Rica army on it. And it has this like little trail of ants because that's the Costa Rica army. They don't have army, Navy, military. And he invested all the, the money into education, into infrastructure, into back into the country that he would have put in the military. So Christiana was his daughter and she went on to become um, involved in the UN and in particular in climate change. And some attribute her uh, to her, the, the reason why the Paris Climate Accord was successful to her and her ability to lead all, you know, I think it was like 129 countries. Uh, you know, and, and all the differences amongst these countries, likes right? So all the big countries like the U.S. are, are kind of the polluters, right? <laughs> and then they're, the people that get the impact of that pollution is all the small countries, right? So you can imagine getting these two these countries to agree on uh, climate. Uh, so Christiana uh, is a very powerful leader. And um, I had the opportunity to interview her for a summit that I did a while back. And she talked about the three mindsets that she brings to leadership and to, to climate. And these are, these are three mindsets, I think, of a wise leader and three mindsets that we can bring into this election. So the first um, mindset is stubborn optimism. And, you know, Christiana, she talked about you know, I kind of picked a, I picked an area that is an area that people say we have no hope, right? And and that the that really stubborn optimism for her means bringing that hope as an input, bringing it towards her. Hope is a practice. Optimism is a practice. Not necessarily that you're in like some toxic positivity, but that you are practicing it um, and holding on to it because that is what keeps us going, right? Stubborn optimism. And uh, the second mindset has to do with uh, endless abundance. And she talked about endless abundance in, in relationship to our planet of just the endless abundance of sun and wind power, um, endless abundance of water power, endless abundance of love, endless abundance of compassion, that when we can remember that there is endless abundance, um, it resources us right? There's endless abundance. And then finally, the, the third mindset that she talked about is radical regeneration. We all experienced a little radical regeneration during the pandemic when things kind of, um, the air got a little cleaner, people's lives shifted a little bit. Um, we've experienced a little radical regeneration in California here when we had a lot of water and just plants are coming back to life after a lot of drought. But the capacity of our earth to regenerate um, and heal, especially when it's given the time and space to do so, but also ourselves, that, that we have the capacity to have radical regeneration, whether that's in our noble silence in the morning and we do a short little meditation or we come here and are with our sangha 
and we feel that regeneration from being in community with each other, or we go on retreat and the magical things that can happen when you are on a retreat or a vacation or just having dinner with your family, right? We have the capacity to heal under the right conditions. So stubborn optimism, radical regeneration, and endless abundance are Christiana's wise mindsets. And she has a great book called The Future We Choose. Um, my interview with her was on the Wise Effort Summit, and I'm not sure if it's still up or available, but um, I'll try and get that up. But I do think I have a snippet of her on my podcast, The Wise Effort Show. If you, I think I put a snippet of her and Jack Cornfield and a couple of others that were on that summit, and Rick, who's on that summit too. So concluding remarks, um, here are the, the things that I pulled out that I think that we could all embody as wise leaders, that uh, the future of wise leadership is the Sangha. We can practice being positive energizers for each other, uh, practicing wise speech, being aware of our privilege and positionality, practicing not hurrying, happiness is here and now, noble silence, letting the children lead and taking on a wise mindset. Thank you. And we can spend a few minutes on questions. So you can put questions into the chat. I will look. Um, gosh, there's so much. I love how you put the, I love how you put some of the, the gothas of um, the toilet cleaning gothas. <laughs> so good. Um, this is a rich chat. I hope I can get access to it later. Okay, Tony. Yeah, do you want to just? I, I don't know if I'm if I can unmute you or if you can do that or I can ask you to unmute. I really uh, appreciated you speaking to what Ty said about the future. The future is the sangha, and um, having taken part in our late night discussions. Um, on Wednesday nights, that has become more and more apparent to me in terms of uh, what we bring and what we're able to share and how we're able to personally evolve and then take that out into the world. So um, I believe what you said and I believe what Ty said, so thank you. Thank you. Elaine? Yeah, thank you so much. Gosh, that was so beautiful and so important. And this isn't a question, and hopefully I can remember uh, most of this, but several years ago, there was a talk by Gloria Steinem. And at the end of her talk, she asked for questions. And there was an eight-year-old girl in the audience who was so impressed and so taken. Um, and I guess, you know, pe people had told her about what Gloria Steinem did. And she said, I I want to be like you. The little girl said, said to Gloria Steinem, I want to be like you. I want to be a great leader. How do you become a great leader? And, you know, Gloria Steinem was a great activist and, you know, people followed her. But what she said, and, and of course, she, she was older at that point, she stopped. She stopped for quite a while and thought about it. And she said, you really don't want to be in the front of people and have people walk behind you. You, you want kind of like Ty, you said, holding hands and walking together and that you don't have to push them, but because of the way you are and the way you speak and the way you act and what you do, people will want to do that also. And they will want to do that with you together. So it's not, a question of being a leader. And I had never heard anything like that. And I thought, wow, was, you know, the wisdom of all of her experience, because I think she was always kind of out there in the front, you know, and then, then this idea of, no, you want to walk together, which is kind of like the Sangha, that, that we support each other and we walk together. Nobody's out in front. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for letting me share that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Deb, do you have a question? I love uh, a lot of the words and stories you used. 
And I was wondering if you could give an example, an embodied example of stubborn optimism. What does that look like? Mm. What does it sound like? Well, <laughs> I have a teenager. I can talk about stubborn optimism. Um, stubborn optimism, I would say, from an embodied place is, um, you know, feet solid and really believing deep down in your whole being that something is possible, even if it's not probable. You know, we, we have a lot of probabilities, right? We, we think that we, we rely on statistics and probabilities of whether this is, is it probable that this is going to happen or this is going to happen? And I imagine every single one of the people that are here, every single one of you have had a lot of low probabilities in your life that then became possible. And so stubborn optimism, I would say, is, is believing in the, in the possibility, not necessarily even when the probabilities are low, uh, staying open and uh, yeah, having that be a practice. And sometimes the practice is just, this is practice, I'm practicing stubborn optimism. Hope is a practice. Like sometimes that's all it is. It's just saying that. I think, you know, one person that's, I think, a good example of that is Jane Goodall. And, and, and she talks about, in her book of hope, um, she talks about hope for our planet and what, what brings her hope. So that would be another resource. I, I love that book if you wanted to look at beautiful examples of stubborn optimists. Nayeli? Hi. Uh, I just I would just want to share with you during the meditation where you were asking us to think about different types of leaders, I realized that I had a difficult time to find leaders that I know personally, like uh, that I have a relation with them. I can think of different leaders that I look up to, but uh, to make it something more personal for me, it was a little difficult. Uh, the first leader I thought of about the heart was my dog, because she would be a really good leader, uh, open-hearted. But the next, the, the other prompts that you gave us was uh, a little bit more challenging. I thought of uh, some people that I don't know personally, like Thich Nhat Hanh, or like uh, some of the characters uh, in books that I think they're great leaders. So I, I work with that. I thought it was brilliant to bring that into my own experience in, in my own mind. And I also thought about uh, something that Rick also often says that it uh, reach for the low hanging fruit about what is easy. So I just want to share that and, and see if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, well, I think that it sounds like you did a, you, you did it. I mean, it's, so, it's sort of, it's interesting to, to see how, how the mind is creative. And actually, there's actually a whole superhero therapy where people um, identify superheroes that they think embody the values that they want to, you know, live in, in themselves, right? So they, they finding characters in books, I mean, why do, why do we tell all these stories, right? We tell stories through books. We tell stories around fire. We tell story, we tell Greek myths. We tell all sorts of stories because sometimes maybe we don't, have access to that strength or that leadership in our immediate, you know, and, and, and I think a creative mind is one that could go to some of those places and, and bring those in. Um, but, you know, maybe if, if we used a different word, you know, I wonder if leader is, is a loaded word, you know, that sort of, it's, it's a bit of a loaded word for me. I don't yeah. love the word leader yeah. uh, for the same reason of what we just talked about of like, then do you assume that someone's in the lead? Right. Um, so, so maybe if we, we had used the, the word compassionate mind, then maybe, maybe we could have found some more or kind, you know, but, but I, 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 the twist that I, I think tonight that I'm, I guess I'm trying to activate in myself when my own fears come up is, is the belief that we can transform this concept of leadership. Yes. You know, and maybe we can transform that, you know, but there, um, it sounds like you're very, you have a very creative mind that found some <laughs> found some characters to bring in there you know charlotte's web right wasn't charlotte a leader do you have anyone read that book you know about the little um 
you know, a little spider that wrote all those words in the, in the web for the, the little pig Wilbur, like yeah. that's a leader, yeah. right? Yeah. Like our children's books have beautiful examples of, of wise leaders in them. Yes. Yes. Lovely. Lovely. And, and I thought it was wonderful that you brought the Sangha as, as part of the leadership. Uh, and I, I thought that was brilliant because I thought that was something that we all share here in this group. And that was beautiful to, to embody our own leadership for for the rest of us. Yeah. Uh, Diana, uh, as I, before Sarah, I think we'll have time to do uh, uh, talk to Sarah. But there's a there's a question that I think is following up what Nylia said. Linda Robinson at seven nineteen asked this question: What does that mean? The future is the sangha. The future is is community, and I and that when we create community strengths within our community, that's how change happens. You know, and change doesn't happen with one person. Or I learned a lot in this uh, this climate class because I'm not a climate specialist, but we had um, some climate specialists that co-taught the course with us, and I I learned a lot about how our individual actions, you know, on things like climate or voting or as one person may not have an app impact, but as a flock of birds, we do have an impact and that the future, I mean, the way that I always love the diagram that they teach at Plum Village, where they draw like a big circle and they put an X on the circle. It's like, this is right now. And many of us think that we're walking into the future and that the past is coming up is behind us. But at, at at Plum Village, what they teach is that we're actually walking into the past. All of the actions that we did in the past, we're living in in the present, right? And the actions that we're creating right now are what, what are going to come to us. They're actually coming to us from behind. And this is kind of like a mind blowing kind of way of looking at things. But the future is the Sangha, that when we create a Sangha, when we create communities and we create safe communities where we feel supported, we feel seen, we feel that we can all have our individual differences and strengths that work together. I'm a beekeeper, so I know a lot about, you know, the pollinators and the nursery bees all work together, right, to create the hive. When we build that, grow that, strengthen that, then we are creating the future our actions in the here and now. So I guess that's how I would, that's how I would describe it or define it. Um, and I, I, I don't know, I feel that I, I see a shift. I definitely see it in the younger generations of much more collective action. Yeah. Well, I think we have, would have time to, to ask Sarah to um, unmute and, and ask her question. Hi, Diana and everyone. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed today's talk and I appreciate you being here. Um, my question was about wise mindset. I think that flexibility, holding on to hope and letting go can be a, a tense balance. <laughs> and I was wondering what a wise leader, how they would handle those three like things. Yeah, it's a paradox, right? And um you know, oftentimes when we enter into paradoxes, we want to, we want to resolve them. You know, we want to, should I be more flexible here? Or should I be more, um, you know, holding on more tight to my beliefs? Right. And, um, I, you know, there's, there's a bigger question that's being asked this weekend around that in terms of <laughs> leadership, I, the way that I, I would approach that is, um, you know, that you, that you do both the paradox, you, you both and, but you have the equanimity in your heart, right? So it's heart led. Sometimes that means being more flexible and letting go of stuff. Sometimes that means holding, you know, tighter to stuff, but what's, what guides it is your values, your heart. And, um, so it's both, I, I don't, there isn't an answer that, you know, I would say both and enter the paradox of it. Thank you. Yeah. I think yoga teaches a lot about that, right? Um, that we can that we can do both at the same time. We can, and even in that that practice that we 
that we did together of an embodied leader. It's to have a strong spine, but at ease in your body. Right. Um, so, yeah. Any other thumbs ups? Thanks, David. <laughs> Appreciate that. Any other questions? I want to give a little plug that, um, I have this wise effort podcast and this week, um, while I'm gone at Plum Village, I'm airing last year's, which was my return from Plum Village and the lessons I learned. I, I share some similar stories and some of the ones I shared tonight. Um, but uh, I have some some interesting folks on the podcast that you may be, you may like some some that are Buddhist, you know, but but all sorts of topics related to this intersection of contemplative practice and psychology. And um, I'd love for you to to check it out. And that um, you can also go to my website, drdianahill.com, which is mm -hmm. um, another place to go to if you want to find other resources or just connect with me. 